Every religion has a different view of God. Though there are often similarities between these views, the common ground is merely superficial. There are fundamental differences that make each religion distinct and unreconcilable. Logically, contradictory claims cannot all be true. Either one view of God is true, or all of them are false. Many people have made the claim that each religion is a piece of the picture of God, and that all the pieces together form the full picture. This is illustrated in the story of the elephant and the blind wise men. In the story, an elephant is brought to the court of a king who is busy elsewhere in the castle. The king's wise men, who are blind, begin to examine the elephant by touch. One wise man feels the sight of the elephant and says, An elephant is like a wall. A second wise man touches the trunk and says, An elephant is like a snake. Another holds a leg and says, An elephant is like a tree. A fourth feels a tusk and says, An elephant is like a spear. Yet another holds the ear and says, An elephant is like a fan. The last wise man touches the tail and thinks the elephant is like a rope. The blind men then start quarreling about who is right. The king then comes to see what all the fuss is about and tells them they each have only a part of the picture. Each of them is right, and if they just put all their information together, they would have a full picture of the elephant. The problem with this illustration is that if God is the elephant and we are the blind wise men, there's no one left to be the king who sees the full picture. No one is removed enough from the situation to have a clear view. Ironically, the illustration that tries to show that no one has a correct view of God actually illustrates just the opposite. To make this claim, a person would have to have a correct view of God, which is precisely what the claim denies. This brings us back to the question of which God exists. The classic arguments for the existence of God provide us not only with good reasons to believe in God's existence, but they also provide us with a list of some of God's attributes. The cosmological and design arguments show that God is necessary, powerful, transcendent, non-contingent, intelligent, and personal. The moral argument shows that God has a moral will and that He is engaged in the world. All three show that God is uniquely, ultimate, and absolute. As a result, these arguments provide us with a sort of glass slipper, a checklist of criteria that must be met by any accurate description of God. If we can find the foot that fits, we will find a religion that holds to an accurate view of God. Any view that denies one or more of the criteria presents a false view of God. Now, let's take the glass slipper in search of its owner. Atheism claims that God does not exist, or that if He does exist, we can't know anything about Him. The physical universe is all that exists, period. Obviously, this does not account for a single attribute of the glass slipper. And the alternate explanations given by atheists for how the universe came into existence, the appearance of design in the universe, and the existence of morality are all deeply flawed. The only religion to adhere to a form of atheism is Buddhism, which sees God as irrelevant. Because atheism corresponds to none of the ten attributes we can learn about God by observing the world, we can reject atheism as a valid way of understanding God. There's not even a foot to try to put the glass slipper on. Agnosticism says God is unknown, but not necessarily unknowable. Agnostics see their view as neutral ground. For the agnostic, the jury is still out. Actually, agnosticism is not a view of God at all. Instead, it's a description of a person's lack of knowledge or indecision. Obviously, agnosticism fails to address any attributes of the glass slipper. Pantheism is the view that everything that exists is God. There are several different kinds of pantheism. One view holds that God is a force that is in all things. Another view sees God as the totality of everything, that all is one and one is all. And some see God as manifest in many forms, each a part of the ultimate reality. Many pantheists believe nature is just part of the whole. Others believe physical reality is only an illusion. Pantheists believe that God is impersonal. And since everything that exists is part of God, we ourselves are part of God, parts of the divine whole. Because God is impersonal, our individual personhood is only illusion. When we die, we're absorbed into the impersonal whole. 
In pantheism, distinctions such as dualities or opposites do not exist. Things either are or they are not. They are either real or illusion. They either exist or they do not. This means, for example, there can be no right and wrong, good and evil, or true and false. Because God is impersonal, God cannot have a moral will. Whatever is, is reality. The rest is illusion. There are no moral distinctions. Logic and reason are also examples of illusion, since they deal with the opposites of true and false. However, one form of pantheism is based on the observation that the same matter and energy that makes the universe makes us. We're made by the universe, sustained by the universe, destroyed by the universe, and return to the universe after we die. The universe is all that exists. This is called scientific pantheism. One major difference in scientific pantheism is that it does not deny opposites. Rather, it relies heavily on logic and reason. Pantheism fails to account for features of reality revealed by the cosmological design and moral arguments. Because pantheism says God is impersonal, God cannot be intelligent since only persons have intelligence. And God cannot be engaged in the world since intentionality and engagement are also characteristics exclusive to persons. Also, if everything that exists is itself a part of God, then nothing can be transcendent. Lastly, in pantheism, the universe is eternal and unchanging. It has no beginning or end. This would require the existence of actual infinites, something that is clearly impossible. Pantheism has some very difficult problems. One problem has to do with morality. If we're all absorbed into the impersonal whole when we die, then we all share the same fate. How we live makes absolutely no difference. There's no ground for morality. Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler share the same fate. Pantheists also claim that we are a part of God and that God is unchanging. But if we can come to realize that we are a part of God, then we have changed. Thus, God would change because we changed. Non-scientific pantheism has a convenient answer for this contradiction. There is no such thing as logic or reason. The problem with this solution is that it uses logic and reason to claim that logic and reason do not exist. Either there are such things as logic and reason, or there are not. Logic and reason are required to make a statement that denies logic and reason. Looking at our list, we see that pantheism corresponds to only five of the ten attributes of God that comprise our glass slipper. God exists, is necessary, is powerful, is non-contingent, and is unique. Thus, pantheism is a poor explanation for how to understand God. It fails to correspond with features of reality that can be known apart from religion. The glass slipper does not fit pantheism. Religions that have a pantheistic view of God include Hinduism, Taoism, some forms of Buddhism, the New Age movement, paganism, some forms of Unitarian Universalism, Christian science, and Scientology. One way to envision panentheism is to view God as both a seed and a tree. The tree represents everything God could possibly become. The seed represents the actual state that God, and consequently the world, is now in. But in panentheism, the seed never actually becomes a tree. Although God is always growing and changing, God will never attain all that is possible to become. This is why panentheism is also known as process theology. God is always in process. One way to envision panentheism is to view God as both a seed and a tree. The tree represents everything God could possibly become. The seed represents the actual state that God, and consequently the world, is now in. But in panentheism, the seed never actually becomes a tree. Although God is always growing and changing, God will never attain all that is possible to become. This is why panentheism is also known as process theology. God is always in process. In panentheism, the universe, or God, has always existed and always will exist. Yet God is always changing. God is finite and temporal. A finite God always lacks something. That's why it can change. And change is a sequential phenomenon. Things change from one thing to another over time. Thus, in panentheism, God is simultaneously finite and eternal. 
Panentheism has been adopted by some forms of Judaism and Christianity, such as in liberation theology.